Today we have a special guest, Mr. Walter White, who is going to explain to us uh, exactly what the Heisenberg Principle is all Heisenberg's about. Heisenberg's uncertainty theorem states that you can't measure to an, accu to an unlimited accuracy the position and momentum of a particle at the same time. Let me explain this to you. If you wish to locate an electron within the distance x, you can use a device which can measure with a resolution less than x. You can do this by using a light with a wavelength which is almost equal to that length you're trying to measure. This light must collide with the electron with the electron for it to be seen because we know that a photon acts like a particle and has a momentum that is equal to Planck's constants divided by its wavelength, the collision will transfer some of the photon's momentum to the electron. If a more precise location of the electron is wanted, a light with a smaller wavelength will be needed. This will lead to the detecting photon having more momentum, which means more momentum will be transferred to the electron upon detection before the smaller region. Therefore, the smaller region we wish to measure the electron in will lead to a greater uncertainty in the momentum of the electron. This leads to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle with the following relationship. The change in momentum times the change in position is always greater than or equal to the value of Planck's constant. Cut the camera. Cut the camera. Uh, Mr. Seems like Mr. White here has a little appointment to take care of. So, uh, not now, not now, not now. Here, we have a metal surface. This metal surface is covered with electrons. We shoot a beam of light to this metal surface and an electron bounces off with a certain velocity. And this is how we get the photoelectric effect. Here, we have a basketball. Just like in the photoelectric effect, we shoot a certain wavelength of light. Since the basketball has a relatively large mass, it is not shifted at all by the light, meaning we can accurately record its position and velocity. However, for an electron, it is quite different. As you can see here, we are going to shoot a beam of light. This light is then going to hit the electron. Once it hits the electron, it now has a different momentum and different position in space. This creates an uncertainty. And this is how we get the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. So Schrodinger was famous because uh, for, for many different things, but he gave us famous series of lectures in Dublin. Okay, these are the Schrodinger lectures. And so he goes to Dublin, University of Dublin, and he gives these series of lectures. And I believe the Schrodinger Cat lecture was first given in Dublin, or else it's the first time it was sort of written down. But the idea is a thought experiment. He says, if you really want to understand what it means to be using these wave functions and this sort of probabilistic approach of quantum mechanics and how it relates to things like uncertainty, imagine I have a cat in a box, and I put a vial of poison in there. I don't know if the vial's been broken or not, and I don't know if the cat's alive or not, but there's a cat in there poison. So while the box is closed and I can't look inside, the cat is both equally alive and equally dead. Right? Because it's a 50-50 chance of being either or. Right. How do I know what it is? I have to open the box. And Schrodinger points out in, in this thought experiment that until you open the box, the cat is both alive and dead. So if you really want to give it a fighting chance, you never open the box. Once you do, you peaked and you make, the sol you make the wave function collapse to a particular solution, alive or dead, and that's it. And, and the way that that gets built up is all based on probability and statistics. Um, when you toss a coin in the air, until you grab it and put it on your wrist, it's 50% heads, 50% tails, but once you look, it's done. 
And there are other things that you can no longer know about it, right? You can no longer know what the other side could have been. There's no probability associated with it anymore. You've collapsed the solution. And so that, that was Schrodinger's explanation of this weirdness of quantum mechanics that has to do with uncertainty and probability and statistics and everything else. Or is the wave function, as a probabilistic perspective, something that's actually a probability? Okay. Um, and so the, these two schools kind of went up. And at, at the heart of it, though, is the Bohr correspondence principle. So uh, the correspondence principle basically says that as you go from a quantum world to a macroscopic world, all things begin to appear to be classical. Mm -hmm. And that's mostly driven by the magnitude of Planck's constant. So the uncertainty principle goes as right one on h, um, and two h, I guess. And and so the the key there is that if you're much much bigger, or you're looking at measurements that are much much larger than ten to the minus thirty four, um, then it turns out that it looks pretty classical because the error that is there is unmeasurable to the naked eye, right? Mm -hmm. And it's only if we try to measure on such a minute level that we can actually see the uncertainty principle, which is why it's not apparent day in and day out. Now that said, um, uh, if we try to do quantum measurements, or you try to take explicit measurements of things happening in the lab, there are fuzzy areas, and there's a certain limit we can go to, and we know that limit is the uncertainty limit. And that's as good as we can do. Um, the other thing that, I don't know if it even comes up in your textbook, but there are sort of uh, conjugate spaces where uncertainty also applies. So it's not just position momentum. Right? There's, um, sort of an equivalency of energy and time, a couple of other pairings that you can come up with. And so some measurements that have been done in labs actually measure these other connections beyond, you know, other than directly trying to measure both error and momentum and position or get other relationships. And that's where you usually see problems is in the time or the frequency domain. Done polarized, photons exist in all of their possible states all at once. They are constantly moving in every direction. This unpredictable motion can be controlled though. With the use of light emitting diodes, LEDs, quantum cryptographers can create one photon at a time. This photon can then be forced to take on specific states with the use of polarization filters. The photon will remain in this known polarized state unless disturbed by an outside force. This means that it can only be accurately measured with a filter that is the same as the polarizing filter used. If a different filter is used, either the photon will not pass through or the spin will be altered. For cryptography to work, two people will need to have the same filters so they can send and receive photons in known polarization states. Both people involved in the message will have to know the exact order of filters to use. When accurately measured on the receiving end, this can be translated into binary code, which can be again translated to any words or numbers. Because of the uncertainty principle, if someone tries to intercept the message in the middle of its transmission, the path and or polarization of the photon will be altered. The photon will not be able to be correctly measured on the receiving end of the message. Once it is known that the photons are being altered, it will be known that a third, unwanted party is trying to hack into the secret message.